When we think of Christmas, we often think of the idea of coming home. You know, I know even with my own family, we have our one daughter and son-in-law, they, they, they're back home, and we have our other daughter, we look forward to getting back home on, on Tuesday, and we're looking forward to having everybody back together. And, uh, and, and that's a joy. And yet, when I think of that whole picture of coming home and how that's important through Christmas, and I think then about, okay, well, what's a biblical picture of coming home? That's, I love the story of, the, of what we often call the prodigal son. It's a story of coming home, a story of coming back and being received and being celebrated and of a great meal. And so that's what we're studying in this, uh, these weeks coming up to Christmas. We're going to look at then Christmas Eve, looking really at the story of the father. And, uh, but this morning, we're going to look at really the second son. It's a part of the story that we tend to not look at. And so it's in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. If you have a Bible, I'd invite you to to follow along with us. But let me begin by reading the story. It's a long story when you look at the whole thing. But let me begin by reading the whole story of uh, what we often refer to as the prodigal son. And he said, this is of Jesus, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went out and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and yet no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For the son was dead. Uh, my, My son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. And his father came out and entreated with him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours, and it was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this brother of yours was dead and is now alive. He was lost and is now found. May God bless the reading of his word. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the privilege again of being able to come together, Father, to be able to study this passage. Thank you for the way you continue to teach me. And I pray now that your spirit would speak. Father, help, help me to just have a heart, open a heart to let you speak through me. And Father, help each one of us to have hearts that are open to hear what you have for us today. Not only to understand what these, these, this parable means, but Father, to understand and to apply what it means to us in our lives. I pray your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, when we think of Christmas, we often think of of family. We think of the time we all come together. And specifically, I think for many of us, the highlight is the meal. It's the celebration when we all come together and we, we share this special meal together as a family. The prodigal son, when you think about this, it's about the importance of our relationship with God. And in this story, Jesus talks about that and describes it in terms of family, that this is a father and son. This is is our heavenly father's pursuit of us. It's a story that illustrates the idea of coming home, and ultimately, the the ultimate picture of unity, of relationship, is, is in what? It's in a feast. It's in a meal. It's in a celebration. 
And so as we prepare for this Christmas season, you know, that's why we're studying this story, which isn't traditionally seen as a Christmas story, but yet many of the themes really fit what we understand to be important in Christmas. You know, even as I was reflecting on this, I realized that if it's all about relationship, one of the problems is that many times we stumble over this relationship with God in large part because we come to God and we kind of have our own opinions about about who God is, about how we're to relate to him. And, and we have our own opinions, and the problem is sometimes what we think God should be or how we relate to him is different than what God has said about himself and revealed about himself in the Bible. In fact, I think it's a core problem that all of us struggle with. All of us at the core really start out with wrong ideas about God. And the question is, are we going to come and, and kind of demand that God conform to us are we going to come to God's word and let him kind of reshape us, reshape our assumptions? I don't know how many times I've heard people that have struggled with this and stumbled over it, and they will say something like, well, the God that I always think of is like this, or uh, the, the God that I personally believe in, well, he would just accept everyone, or sometimes even you see a little bit of the spirit of arrogance when we say something, I can't believe in a God that would do this or would do that. Now, here's why I say that's arrogant. The spirit behind even that statement is basically saying, I believe something about God, and for me to believe in God, he has to conform to me. It's not that God is outside of me, and I have to figure out something about who he is and what to reveal to him. No, no, the ultimate truth is me. And for me to be able to believe in God, he has to conform to my expectations of what I expect him to be. And if he isn't going to do that, I just can't believe in that God. I just can't, I can't follow that God who doesn't conform to me. And no, we've got to realize that there is a God that exists outside of us. And he's revealed himself and the challenge is for us to come to God and say, okay, God, what do you reveal about yourself and how do I conform to you? See, too often we have our own expectations. And with that comes, expect, you know, we have beliefs and expectations. So I think that well, because God is this way, if I do A and then I do B, then God's got to do C, and that's our expectation. But what if our, again, if our expectations and our core assumptions are wrong? Well, let's go outside of the spiritual dimension for a moment. We realize that there are many things that we may think are true that our assumptions could be wrong. But, but because we have wrong assumptions, I still may think if I do A, then then do B, then C will happen, and I expect it, but if my assumptions are wrong, then I'm going to end up with a different C than I expect, than I expect to happen. Let me even, yeah, I was reminded of, of just re reading this week about an old story uh, that illustrates this in a kind of true, it's a true story, uh, humorous way. In fact, it was a story that made national news when it happened back in 1982, uh, it's a story about a guy named Larry Walters from North Hollywood, California, and he had this really creative idea. And he thought, I live in such a beautiful area. Uh, what I'd love to do is to get a bird's eye view of this. And so what if I buy some really big weather balloons and, uh, and tie them to a chair and float above the ground, and, um, and I can see this bird's eye view. What could go wrong? So, so here's what he did. He went to the local Army-Navy surplus store, he got 45 large weather balloons. He got a couple tanks of helium. He then took his recliner chair. He strapped these weather balloons to his recliner chair. And, um, and he, first of all, tied the recliner to the Jeep, of, uh, rope to the Jeep of his bumper. And then he inflated the balloons with helium. He then he had several. He packed sandwiches. He backed a six bite of Miller Lite. And, and then he tied some extra ropes to his chair that he anchored into the ground, and so his goal was, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut the rope to the, uh, to the Jeep, and I'm going to go up the 30 feet up, and I'm going to be able to just float up there for as long as I want. Then he had a pellet gun, and he was, was going to shoot some balloons out to be able to descend the way that he when expected to. But the problem was that his science wasn't quite right. Uh, and doing A and then B didn't work out to the C he expected because the, there was a lot more helium than he thought. So when he cut the rope to the Jeep, he ascended 30 feet much faster than he expected, so much so that he got to 30 feet and it tore all the stakes out of the ground. And the balloon kept going up, not 30 feet, not 100 feet, not 1,000 feet. It went up 16,000 feet. That's over three miles in the air. 
And it went up so fast that, that he was scared to death. He's, you know, he's three miles in the air, and he's scared to death of shooting the balloons out now because he doesn't know what's going to happen. And so he was up there not for as long as he expected. He was up there for 14 hours, eventually drifting into the approach path of the L.A. airport. And uh, they saw him. They took this picture. And could you imagine the first pilot that saw him crawls the tower? Hey, L.A. Tower, I see a guy in, a, in a, a recliner with balloons tied to him, and he's got a gun, and he's floating up here in the approach path. I mean, could you imagine that description and how the tower would respond to that? And uh, finally, he got the courage to start shooting out a few balloons, and he started to descend. But even then, there was a problem, because when he came down, he had all these lines that were tied that were supposed to anchor him down that caught, caught in power lines and blacked out part of Long Beach, California. And, um, you know, and, and we got fined a ton of money. And you feel like, man, what a crazy story. Almost, tra- you know, almost fatal in its craziness. But when you look at that and you say, oh, well, though it's a lot less obvious, it actually shows something that, that we can misunderstand our assumptions about what is true. And then we can think A, B, and C, A and B will equal to C. Well, what if that's true about God? It's less obvious, but we can have assumptions that we think we know, God, if you're this way, I can press this button, and then this button, and this is going to happen, but what if we're wrong? You see, when you look at the whole story in Luke 15, what you see is that actually Jesus is confronting this problem, of, of this problem of sometimes how we can think we know things about God and think we know what's going to happen, but our assumptions can be totally wrong. It's a story, again, we often refer to as the prodigal son. We think it's about one lost son, but when we really dig into it, what becomes evident is it's a story of two lost sons. There are two lost sons, both of which represent two wrong views about God. See, he's telling these two stories. Both of these sons thought they knew the father. Both of them thought they knew what buttons to push to get what they wanted. And both of them were completely wrong. Talk about having wrong beliefs about God. And what you see here is two of the most common wrong assumptions, two of the most common wrong beliefs about God that people have when we, when we approach God. And in fact, um, let me even show a little bit of how this is playing out. We've read the story a moment ago, but let me go back to the beginning of Luke 15, the context. Jesus didn't just tell the story out of, in a vacuum. It was actually in response to something that was happening. So look at Luke 15, verse 1, what, ha- what we read. Now, there were tax collectors and sinners who were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he's telling the story in response to these complaints that he's getting from the religious people about him receiving sinners, people that they rejected as being you know, evil sinners. And what you see is in the telling of the story is that the two sons represent the two groups of people that were listening. So the younger son represents the tax collectors and the sinners. These were the people who had thrown off traditional morality. These were the people that rejected, you know, the the faith of their fathers. These were the people that were rejected by other people. But on the other hand, you have the teachers of the law, the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious people. They're represented by the older brother. These are the rule keepers, the obedient ones, the ones that are going to church all the time. And what we need to see is that in these two approaches, you see both of them are lost. Now, let me look back up and say, okay, well, what are these two approaches? The first one is, again, is the younger son symbolizes what I'm going to call relativism. And this is the idea that, you know, that God is this all-loving God, which means that he's also all-accepting and all-affirming of all lifestyles, of all choices, Because he's our father, he wants us to be happy, so he affirms everything. We can even reject him. We can even ignore his teaching and scripture. We can make up our own morality, and God just wants us to be happy, and at the end of the day, he's okay with that. So instead of coming to God and his word and allowing it to be a source that challenges us, and all of us need to be challenged because we all are sinners, instead we start the assumption that, you know, well, God made me this way, so therefore any feeling I have, any desire I have, well, God wants to affirm it. And so I'm going to look in the Bible and I'm going to find, start with the assumption that he's looking to affirm the decisions that I make. I don't need to worry about obeying God or about obeying the Bible. Or, um, you know, I can basically, the younger son, what did he do? He came and he said, Dad, you know, I just want your stuff. I wish you were dead. Give me your stuff. And he expected the dad to deliver. 
because that's the way he you know, thought the father was. Now, this isn't a new problem. It's something that Jesus was addressing way back then. It's not just about maybe the, the sins that we would, our culture would look at and focus on today. No, it's actually a really old issue. In fact, I, I ran across something uh, C.S. Lewis, many know, is a great author from England, and, and 80 years ago, he wrote a little book called The Problem of Pain. And in that book, he talked about this exact problem, this, this problem of our tendency to view God as this all-affirming heavenly grandfather. Here's what he said. What would really satisfy us would be a God who said, of anything that we happen, that we happen to like doing, what does it matter as long as they're contented? We want, in fact, not so much a father in heaven as a grandfather in heaven, a senile benevolence who, as they say, like to see the young people enjoying themselves. And that's what the younger son believed. You know, I've got this father who just is just affirming. It's just anything that I can ask. I could even just ask for all my inheritance. I, I can run away from him, and he's still going to give it to me because that's what he has to do. Now, that's one view, relativism. The other view is what we see in the older son, and that's what we're going to call more religion. He represents the perspective of religion. And, um, and this is a belief that says, if I'm going to find God, the way of it of, is basically I've got to keep the rules to keep God happy. Uh, I want to say, apart from true biblical Christianity, all world's religions are based on some form of this belief. Now, the different religions have different rules over the things that you're supposed to do or not supposed to do to God, keep God happy, but the basic principle is the same. It's all about what we do. Well, maybe you ask God to forgive, but it's God forgives and then it's what we perform. And so in this parable, you have these two sons. The one is the immoral, the one is the bad boy, the other one is the good self-disciplined one. But both are equally alienated from the father. Both of them, at the end of the story, the father is going out to and trying to bring back home. Now, this isn't usually the way that we read the story. Usually when we think about this parable, we think of just the younger son. We call it the prodigal son, talking about just the, the younger one. And, um, and the thing is, is that we focus on it because his lostness is far more obvious. But when you look at this story, Jesus is trying to make it clear, both of them are lost. In fact, even when you look at the, the whole um, structure of the parable, what is the climax? What is the ending? What is the, the ultimate you know, end point? It's not the father going out and welcoming the son and bringing him in and, and having the feast and the fatted calf. No, that's in the middle of the story. That's verses 20 to 24. The ending point is in verses 28 through 32. It's the whole dialogue between the father and the older brother where the older brother refuses to come in and ultimately ends the whole conversation on the outside. See, Jesus is telling this about the, to the Pharisees, and he's challenging the religious people. Now, so you have two sons. Both of them represent different ways of false beliefs about God, ways that we can ultimately reject relationship with God. But ultimately, while there, there are differences, the core problem is the same. Both of them are ultimately dealing with the problem of alienation from the father. So for those who were with us last Sunday, when we looked at the, the younger son, we saw that in that story, Jesus is redefining and properly defining the essence of sin. A lot of times, and a lot of people will say, well, what is sin? Well, it's breaking the rules. It's you know, not doing the, the, the commands that God gave us. And whereas that's, that's sometimes an expression of sin, that's not, the ultimate, you know, that's not the ultimate core of sin. The ultimate core of sin isn't breaking rules, but it's in rejecting God. It's in rejecting his place in our life. It's being alienated and being alienated in our relationship with him. The younger son's ultimate sin wasn't in taking the money and blowing it on wild living. It was in telling his dad, Dad, I don't want a relationship with you. I don't want you in my life. It's when he went to his dad and said, Dad, I want my inheritance. I want you, your stuff, without you. I wish you were dead. And if you were dead, I would have the inheritance and I would be happy. So let's just pretend you're dead and I'll pretend you're dead and I'll just take your stuff and run away. That's at the core of what sin is. For all of us, it's when we do that with God. Now, what, what we need to see is that Jesus is teaching that it's just as possible to do this even when we're religious and being a rule keeper. Even, it, we don't, it's more obvious for the younger son, but the older son is keeping the rules. 
And he is just as far from the father as the younger son was. It just looked differently. They are both alienated from the father. Now, the older one has all the appearances of the compliant son, of being home, of being there all the time. But we see that everything that he was doing wasn't based on relationship. It was all based on duty. He didn't have a relationship with his, his father. It was based on, here's what I'm doing, and it was based on the expectation that if I do these things, then you owe me. In fact, let me show you even from the text here. If you look in, in the story, look in verse 29. This father goes out to the son, and the son is refusing to come in, and he explains why he's angry. And he starts by saying to his dad, look, these many years I have served you. Now, what's interesting is in, is in the original, the word serve actually there is often probably better translated as, as slave. It's a, it's a verb form of the word slave. And the New Living Translation actually carries this idea, so it translates this verse this way. He said, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing that you told me to do. Yeah, I've stayed at home, you know, but I've been doing it out of duty. I've been slaving for you. It's not about relationship. This isn't the way that a loving son with a loving relationship with his dad talks to his dad. You don't slave. It's, it's basically, I'm doing these things because I have to, and if I do them, then, then you owe me. I'm, I'm earning your reward. I'm earning the, the inheritance. Think about it. The younger son came and he demanded his inheritance saying, I'm entitled to your stuff because of my birthright. I can reject you, but I'm still entitled to the stuff because of my birthright. You, I can press A and B and you have to give me C. The older one, likewise, is coming to his father and basically saying, I'm entitled not because of birthright, but because of performance, because I've slayed for you, because I've never done these, you know, I've never disobeyed you, therefore you owe me. Both of them were driven by a sense of entitlement. Both of them ultimately valued the father's things over relationship with the father. The younger son comes to inheritance, I don't want you, I just want your stuff. The older brother has the same attitude. Think about it, why is he so ticked off here? He's ticked off because when the, you know, the younger brother suddenly is having a, a feast thrown towards him, and he says, he hasn't earned these things. He's lost the right. You know, he re rejected you. I've earned it. I deserve it. He doesn't. And you're giving away stuff that, you know, that's, that's my stuff, and I'm, I'm, he's angry. And basically, even at the end of the day, what's he doing? He's, he's staying out of the feast. He refuses to come home. Because he's saying, basically, if you don't give me my stuff on my terms, I don't, I don't care about a relationship. What I care about is the stuff. I care about the inheritance. Both of them were living for themselves in just different ways. But just even if you come back and you say, oh, I'm not sure, because, because we don't tend to see the, this alienation of the older brother. Well, let me show you even a little bit more. Let's go a little deeper, and you see the reality of this, this alienation. Again, Go back to the younger son. What happened is we're told that, that his alienation was that he took his stuff and he left home. And when he came back, he was restored. And he was restored and brought into the family. He was brought into this place of, of feasting and this relationship. Now go back to verse 28 of Luke 15 and what we're told, that the older son was angry and what did he do? He refused to go in. He refused to go into the, ho the home. He refused to have, be a part of this feast. And so what happens is his, his father is forced to then come out and entreat with him. He's lost on the outside, and the father has to go out to him, just like the younger brother, when he came home, the father ran out to him to bring him in. So now we have the older the brother, the dad's going out again, and he's trying to bring him back in. Both of them are lost. Now someone would say, but in verse 31, the father tells him, son, you're always with me. Well, does, wasn't he with him then? Well, no. What the point is that it's possible to be there physically and not really have a real relationship. It's possible to be a churchgoer, to be a rule keeper, to be a good person and not really have a real relationship with God. To just sit there and not relate to him as a father, but to relate to him as, okay, here's the rule keeper. I'm going to push your button so that you have to give me what, you, what I expect. Actually, this is something taught throughout the Bible. Jesus talks about it in another place in Matthew chapter 7. Look what he says there. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, uh, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, 
Did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. And he's saying, okay, these are people, Jesus, we were there and we were keeping the rules. We were doing all the right things. And Jesus said, we said no, I never knew you. I didn't have a relationship with you. You didn't relate to me for who I am. Because it's possible to be a good person, church-going person, rule-keeping person who, who dedicates our life to good deeds and still be alienated from the Father, not have a relationship with the Father. Even in that, think about it this way. Think about another picture of this alienation. Here, this is, why are they having a feast? Because this is one of the best days in the father's life. His son has been gone. He's returned home. His father is celebrating. His father, you know, is, is, is throwing this feast and inviting everyone there. Now, the older son refuses to come in. He's literally, there's a feast and you have one of the sons that are basically saying, I refuse to be a part of this in a way that in that culture would have been really a smack in, his, in dad's face, an embarrassment. Now, what's going on? Why can't the older son rejoice? Well, because he doesn't value what the father values. He's not at all connected. He doesn't have this relationship with the father so that, so that he's, he, what he sees is he sees what he wants. Okay, what does he want? Think about it this way. When the younger son went to the dad and said, okay, I want my part of inheritance. In that time, again, the younger son would have gotten a third. The older son would have gotten two-thirds. We talked about last week that if you were with us, that, that this was not like just a bank account. It wasn't a savings account. The dad had to sell some of his property and, and liquidate to be able to give that to the younger son. Now, the older son, what's the older son thinking? Okay, one-third has been sold off. Everything else is mine. Everything else is what I'm going to inherit. Everything else is going to be, is, is going to be mine. So now what happens is suddenly he sees the father going out and killing this fatted calf, and he's thinking, that's my fatted calf. And he's, he's giving him a robe, and he's giving him a ring. So those things should be mine. Those are things that I earned, that I deserve, because I've been good. I've been a rule keeper. This son of yours, he doesn't deserve it, because he squandered that. He gave up his right. Do you know why he's angry? He's angry not just because of the grace that's being shown to the, the, to the older brother. He's angry because his sense is that the dad is giving away things that, that he thinks he deserves. What do we see here? We see this religious lostness, and we're seeing character traits of, that, God, that Jesus is teaching us about. Again, we can look at the younger son. His lostness is really obvious. When you reject God, you want nothing to do with God. That's obvious to see. But he's saying, okay, to the Pharisees, to the people, that churchgoers even of our day, it's possible to keep the rules and not really ever be super rebellious and still really be lost. And what are some character traits of that? Well, the first is, is that we may obey, but we obey out of duty to earn reward. Again, the older brother, he stayed there. He worked. He did the right things. He obeyed the father. He was good, right? But what drove him? Was it relationship? No. What drove him, he said it, we said, read it just a few moments ago, verse 29. All these years I've slaved for you. I've done the right things. I've done it out of duty. It's not out of joy. It's not out of relationship. I've done it out of duty. And it's really interesting is that if you look at even with the old younger son, here's a contrast. The younger son at the end comes back and he says, I've lost my right. I don't deserve to be called your son Dad, bring me on as a hired hand. Basically, I'll, I'll, whatever you give me, I'll work my way into it now. And what does the father do? He comes and he says, Dad, I'll be the slave. And the father says, no, I'm going to accept you as my son. The one who said, I'm willing to be the slave, says, no, I'm going I'm to give you all the rights of a son. You've got the robe. You've got the feast. You've got, because you didn't deserve it. Because of grace. Now, here you have the older son, who seems to be the son, is in the role of the son. And he basically says, I'm doing all the son, but really, I'm a slave. He sees himself as a slave, and as long as he sees himself there, and what I'm doing is I'm earning, I'm doing it out of duty, he's never really under, able to understand and accept the Father's love and grace as a son. So here you have the older one, he's coming and he's saying, not only have I been slaving, but because I've been slaying, I deserve it. And so the two-thirds of the inheritance, that's what I deserve. He doesn't deserve it. This son of yours who squandered it all, he, he didn't do the right things. I've done the right things. And you know why he's angry? He's angry because the father's spending what he thinks is his money. 
This is my inheritance that I've worked for, and why are you taking that fatted calf and wasting it on this guy that doesn't deserve it? Remember back when we, if you were here last week, we looked at the younger son, and, and the younger son basically goes to the dad and says, give me my share of the inheritance. I deserve a third. Was it his? No. Did he deserve it? No. He was wrong about his relationship. It was completely the father's, and the father could choose to give it at his time and his way, or the father could choose to take it away. It was never his. But he wrongly thought that it was. He thought it was his by birthright. Now you have the older son doing the exact same thing. He's doing the exact same thing where he's coming and he's saying, you know, you're spending my inheritance, you're expending my money, it's mine. It's mine, not because of birthright, because I've earned it. And, and because I pressed A and pressed B, therefore I should get C, I should, I should get the reward. And he's angry because he sees the father's basically taking away what he thinks is his. And he's not concerned about the father's heart, he's concerned about the father's things. And what happens is a religious spirit, because we obey out of duty and expectation, then we get angry when God seems to not deliver. And that's exactly what happens. Is he sits there and he looks at it and he sees the father welcoming the old younger brother. And, and, and part, part of the anger is not just, okay, why are you showing him kindness, but why are you spending my inheritance on him? You should be giving me stuff. I deserve stuff. And you're taking some of my stuff and you're giving it to him and I'm angry because I should have control. It's the stuff that he thought that he deserved. I want to tell you, in, in 30 plus years as a pastor, what I have consistently seen is one of, if not the primary reason that I've seen people that have been part of the church had some relationship with God who have wandered away and some have wandered completely away, some have just disengaged and they come but they really become distant is based on this whole deception that we see be playing out here. It's based on this idea that, God, I did what was right, and you failed to deliver. Something bad happens in our life. You know, somebody gets sick, and somebody dies, a relationship falls apart, we lose a job, and something bad happens, and we pray, and we seek God, and we say, God, here's this problem, and, and you need to do this, or here this opportunity, and please open this up. Give me this relationship. You know, provide this job. And we pray and we pray, and then suddenly God doesn't expect what we do what we expect him to do. And the response is often anger. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen people that when they prayed and something doesn't happen, it's, well, I just can't trust God anymore. I can't. And they walk away. Some completely walk away from the church. Some, well, they may come, but they just, they used to have a close relationship with God. Now it's, now it's just a distance because I can't trust him anymore. And basically it's saying, God, you don't understand. I've done these things. I've earned my inheritance. I, I, I've done all the right things, and then when I came to you and I, I asked for the inheritance that I deserve, suddenly, you know, you, you bail out. You're giving it to somebody else. You're not giving it to me. And what benefit is there in life? You know, if, if, if you aren't going to pay off your debts, <laughs> then what's the purpose? And what we're saying is it's not about a relationship with God. You see, it's about a religious performance and I'm mad because God isn't doing his part of the deal as I expect him to. I'm pressing A and I'm pressing B and God's not delivering C. And I want to tell you, I know because I've just done this so long. There are people here today that you are struggling with this. You may have been struggling with this for decades. That there was a time where you expected God to work and you prayed and he didn't work. And he asked him to intervene and he didn't intervene. And suddenly it's like, God, how can I trust you? God, you know, I'm, you know, from now on, I'm on the outside of the house. And maybe you've been part and God brought you here today because he wants you to know he's pursuing you. Maybe you've just been distant from the church or you're distant from God. And he's brought you here because he wants to pursue you. He wants you to realize, okay, what's going on is we're distant, we're angry. Because we feel he hasn't answered our prayer, he hasn't met our need. He, we feel like he hasn't given us something that we think that we deserved. And, and basically, we can look at the younger son and say, boy, that's a terrible guy, and boy, he rejected God. Our attitude when we say that is exactly that of the younger son. The only difference between the younger brother and the older brother is why they expected the father to give them what they demanded. That's the only difference. 
The younger brother expected it because it was his birthright. And I can reject you and still expect it. The older brother expected it because we earned it. He thought he earned it. And the younger brother distanced himself when he got what he wanted because he could do it by his own rules. The older brother distanced himself from the father when he didn't get what he thought he deserved, what he didn't, what he wanted. And basically, he's doing, when he did that, he's saying, your things are more important than your relationship. And if you fail to deliver on things, I'm just going to distance myself from relationship because it's not about a relationship with you. It's about, it's about a religion. It's about performing. And I've pressed A and B, and you haven't delivered C, so, so why even pretend to have a relationship? My friends, I say that, that there are people that are here because I, I know, I've just, I, I've been there, I've struggled with this. I, probably all of us do at one period of time. And there may be, there are almost certainly people that are here today and God has brought you here to hear this story because he's pursuing you as, as this father pursued the older brother and saying, I know you don't want to come out. I know that you're, you're locking yourself out from the relationship, but I'm entreating you to come back in. I'm entreating you to let you know how much I love you. I'm entreating you to know that the most valuable thing I can give you isn't the stuff, it's the relationship. See, but when we come from a religious perspective, we get angry when he doesn't deliver and and, and then we demand relationship based on our own terms. And so, no, if I'm going to come in, you've got to do this first. And that's what ha- happened. It's the older brother. He's standing outside. And he said, well, I'm not going to go in as long as you're doing that. I'll, I'll, I'll have the relationship, but on my own terms. My friends, again, when we think of this, what does it mean to have a relationship with God as our Father? It means, first and foremost, accepting Him as God, as our Father knowing that it's not about rules, but it's about coming to him and saying, I recognize you are my creator and you have the right to to declare what's true, to declare what's true about yourself, about about morality, about my life. And, And the only way for me to really have a relationship with you isn't on my own terms, but it's to come as I am. And even if I'm as messed up as younger brother was, even if I just come and I say, I don't deserve it. God, I'm so far from you. I come in my brokenness like the younger brother, and say, I don't deserve this. And then you have the father to say, okay, I want to give you what you do not deserve. We're broken, or we're welcome and, and, and invited and celebrated as, as children into the banquet, not based on what we've done. See, it, that's what it's about. It's about this invitation to this banquet. We talk about Christmas and family and coming home and being with family and how wonderful that is. And being embraced. That's what God's picture is here. You know, it's amazing. It's not only here, it's throughout the Bible. Repeatedly, he talks about our relationship as a banquet. In fact, there's numerous places where it talks about it, not just as a family banquet, but as a marriage banquet. The wedding feast where we come and we're united in the most intimate, most binding ways. And there's a banquet that goes on in Revelation 19 that goes on for eternity. That's the banquet that God wants to have with us. That kind of intimacy, that kind of relationship. But how do, we, how do we have that? How do we get that? How do we get into that banquet? See, the only way in is through grace. If we come and we say, well, I've been slaving for you, so therefore I deserve to get in, then we're going to still be shut out. The only way to get in is when you think about the younger son, what happened is he came and he said, I don't deserve to be your son. I don't deserve to be here. And the father stopped him and said, okay, now you can come on in, now that you understand. My friends, God is inviting each one of us to say, I want that relationship, but it's not based on what you do. It's not based on religion. It's not based on performance. It's not based on being good enough or hoping we're being good enough, nor is it based on on where we've fallen short. There's nothing that can exclude us. The younger son rejected the father in the most significant of ways, and yet the father comes and says, when you finally are able to admit, I don't deserve it, then, then I will give you all the stuff. I will give you the ring. I will give you the feast. I will give you the, the, the identity. All those things based purely on grace. But the question is, the father is pursuing us, and then how do we respond? He's given us this invitation. Even when we do communion, what is communion? Communion is a little shadow of banquet, a banquet relationship with Jesus. And one of the things that we talk about is here's the Christ body and we're going to pass it and everyone is going to be offered. 
It's an outward symbol of an inward reality. And the question is, here is Jesus offered for you. What have you done with it? Have you asked him to forgive your sins? Have you received the gift of grace? Not based on what we've done, but based on our acknowledgement that we're sinners separated from God, that we ask Jesus to forgive our sins and accept his gift of grace and salvation. The only question is our acceptance or rejection of that invitation. And whether you're the prodigal, the young that has walked away and feel like I don't deserve to be here, or whether you're the older brother and, man, I'm doing all the right things and I'm, 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 I'm performing, and, but you realize you don't have a true relationship, God invites you today. You know, I think back several years ago, we had a baptism service, and on the same day, in evening and morning, we had several people being baptized. One was somebody that had come in and had just wandered away, had lived a life that just rejected everything of God's, you know, God's values, rejected everything of, you know, just lived a life pursuing drugs, pursuing pleasure, pursuing and everything. And like the prodigal son, he realized, okay, this is broken, this isn't working, and, and I need to come to God. God, I agree with you that I don't deserve it. And he came as the prodigal son. And what happened in baptism is we celebrated, okay, you have accepted the invitation. You're now part of the family. You're part of this. We celebrate. You're, you've been embraced into this family. But at that very same time, we had someone else, a man in his 70s, who had been to church from the time that he was, he was raised in church. He had been going to, to church you know, from the time that he was young. He was, a, he was a rule keeper. He had he'd been in our church for a number of years. And he had done all these things. He had done everything right. And yet, when he started really getting deeper into the study of the Bible, he had somebody ask him questions, and he suddenly realized, okay, my relationship with God, it's about, it's about rules. I think that God will let me in because I've done the right things. I've performed from God. I've pressed the right buttons. And he suddenly realized that he didn't have a relationship with the Father, that he was in the story. He was the older brother. And yet, instead of staying on the outside and saying, I've got to do this, and being angry, he suddenly realized, no, that, the, that God was pursuing him. And he was willing to come and say, God, I agree with you. I don't deserve this. I ask you to forgive me. I want a relationship with, with you, not only as my rule keeper, but as my father. I ask you to forgive me through Jesus Christ. I want that relationship. I talked with him even after the service in the first service. And I said, how are you doing? Man, it's... And he just was remembering back. And he says, it's just great. You know, it's just those memories of just how God has changed that relationship with him because he moved beyond just being the older brother rule keeper and, and understanding what it really was to have a relationship with the father. See, Christmas is a story about God coming and pursuing us, not only going outside of the house and pursuing us, but as we're going to talk about tonight, literally coming from the house of heaven and taking on human flesh and pursuing us in the most significant way it's about God bringing you here today to say, no, I'm pursuing you. And whether you're walking away from him and rejecting him and think, want nothing to do with him, or whether you are a religious person, you know, just trying to keep the rules, or whether you are here and you've been kind of angry with God because God hasn't kept his end to the bargain, and, and you expect God to perform, and he hasn't, no matter where you're at. The fact is, is that God is pursuing you. And I hope and pray that this Christmas is a season that you not only know about the stories, but that you're able to say, you know, this year I've come home. This year I've come home into this, to this intimate relationship with my God and my Father that I was designed for. This year is the year that, that I've come not on my own terms, not on my own beliefs and, and expecting God to conform to me, but that I'm hearing God's invitation and I'm recognizing that he's invited me to come to him, to relate to him based on his grace and what Jesus did in coming and dying on the cross. My friends, I pray that this Christmas, if you're there, that again, you may be some, that you might be the prodigal and you say, God, I, I agree with you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Forgive me. And he will. You may be those that have wandered away and you're angry and you're just, God hasn't delivered. You say, God, I agree with you. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. You know, I've, I've come and I've made you relate to me. I'm, I'm that older son. I've, I've, I've valued your stuff over you. God, I need your forgiveness. And he will. He's inviting you back into relationship. You might be there and say, I've been keeping all the rules, but I don't have that intimate relationship. I don't really know him. And come and say, God, I ask you to forgive me and accept me, not based on what I've done, but what Jesus has done. I accept 
his gift by faith. And to as many as received him, as it says in John 1, he gives the right to become children of God. He invites into the home, into the feast, into the relationship that we were designed to have. 